Tony's going to come and read to us from God's Word. Thanks, Tony. Our reading this morning is uh, John 15, 1 to 17. The title is The Vine and the Branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does, does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. Thanks ever so much, Tony. What are you frightened of? Anybody here got any phobias? Yes? Snakes? Not many snakes in Risker or Baysleg. Unless there's something going on. Snakes? How many people here are frightened of snakes? Yeah? Any sp- spiders? The what? The dentist. Oh, Julia, what have you done? Honestly. How many people here are frightened of the dentist? Oh, she's lovely. She's lovely. But her profession has a lot to answer for. Does anybody here suffer from cumponophobia? Wayne? No. No. Cumponophobia. Anybody? David? No, you don't. No? Componophobia. No? Do you know what that is? The fear of buttons. (laughs) These are genuine. These are genuine. I kid you not. Podophobia? What was that? Yeah, the fear of feet. Anybody here frightened of feet? (laughs) What about, um, oh, scholasciphobia? No, worms. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Sinophobia? Might be supply, um, kino, I don't know. Kino? Let's try kinophobia. Come on, Julia. Yeah. Fear of what? 
The fear of exercise, no. It's the fear of dogs, apparently. What about patromerohanophobia? Pateromero... Pater, pater, <laughs> it's the fear of aeroplanes. We'll just stop there. What about iridophobia? Ooh, right idea. Rainbows. Look at that. All right, this one. Hayward, this is you, man. All right? You have got electrophobia. Electrophobia. You know what that is, Lisa? The fear of chickens. <laughs> you are. You're scared stiff for chickens, aren't you? I've seen you run a mile in Tesco's. <laughs> They're there, frozen, not going to touch you, and you're... <laughs> Watch it. Right. Here's one. Here's one for... For me and Jonathan, where's Jonathan, right? This is you and me, mate, okay? We have the fear, we have catophobia, or maybe chatophobia, whatever it is. You get what that one is? Anybody? Who else has got it here? Let me just see. John Lewis, you've got a little bit of it. Lawrence, a little bit. John Harris, a little bit of it. It's the fear of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Look! I must, I must be frightened of it, surely. That's why it's leaving my body. It's not doing it for any other reason. Gosh. And uh, dendrophobia. Do you know what that is? Dendrophobia. I don't... Yes. Gosh, intelligent people. Clientele here today. That's wonderful. Yes, the fear of trees. My personal favorite, chronomentrophobia. You guess what that one is? Fear of what? Underwear? No. <laughs> How rude. This isn't an Anglican church. Gosh. <laughs> it's the fear of clocks. We've got a fear of clocks here because there is no clock here. It's lovely. There's a calendar. If you get out today, you'll be doing well. Uh, but that's it. Now, fear. Fear is an amazing thing. And um, many of us, I'm sure, can a look back at times in our lives when we've been frightened of things, stuff's happened, and we've been scared. And uh, I don't know about you, but I was uh, watching some of the news reports this week uh, coming from the northern coast of France as they were doing the celebrations uh, from there, from Sword Beach, the BBC based themselves there. And they would interview people. I understand Trevor Bray was uh, certainly captured, wasn't he? Uh, or not by the Germans, he was captured uh, uh, by the BBC. It could be worse for really, the BBC, but there you go. And um, I think to myself, it's easy to talk about fear. But when some of these guys were talking about getting off their boat, off their landing craft, getting into the sea. Again and again and again and again, I heard veterans saying, they asked me if I was afraid. And they'd say things like, of course I was afraid. And I thought, you know, what have I been afraid of in my life? I know that generation have prayed that our generation, us younger ones, would never have to go through the kind of thing that they did. And I'm conscious there are some of you here this morning that went through the war. Maybe you served, maybe you were a child, maybe you were a sweetheart. But you experienced that fear. It's okay, isn't it, to read a list of fears from buttons to clocks to trees, but we're talking about the fear that comes that you might lose your life. And I'm very conscious that this week has been difficult for many people because of those commemorations. And it may have stirred up things in our hearts and our minds. Of course, it's not just those who have served in the great wars. It's those of our military personnel who have served and are still serving in conflicts such as Afghanistan and in other parts of the world. just want you to watch this with me. A 
been in the Air Force for uh, seven and a half, coming up eight years, uh, and that's of a 16-year commission, so uh, just coming up to, uh, to half, halfway. Uh, and uh, my role, uh, I'm a, a Chinook pilot. Went through flying training and got selected for helicopters, and at the end of that, got my wings and got posted to the Chinook. Yeah, spent six months learning to fly the Chinook and then been on the front line for about four and a half years. The environments we work in are dangerous, particularly Afghanistan. Um, you're, you're operating, you know, uh, you're very close to the, to the Taliban, often over the, their heads. We often do get shot at and come back with a few holes in the aircraft. It's my job to keep people safe. That's my main responsibility and my main role. And it, it, I, I don't really think too much about um, what happens if. We go through a lot of training with what ifs, if we, if we end up crash landing somewhere and how to escape. But I think, I do certainly trust God that he's got my life in his hands. I remember hearing someone saying that um, we're immortal until God calls us home. And, and I often think that my life is, is in God's hands and, you know, and so is my timing. And, uh, you know, and that doesn't mean I diminish any responsibility from keeping myself, my crew, and my passengers safe. Um, I'll do my utmost, but I think I just have that sort of sense of peace that God's, you know, in my life and, and is there looking out for me. There was a, a time in Afghanistan last year, it was in April last year, where I was shot in the foot. That was quite a big, a big challenge. The story was we dropped off some troops first thing in the morning, and we were going back in to go and pick them up. So it was during the, the extract. Landed on to pick up these troops and came under contact um, from, from the Taliban. And uh, yeah, one of the rounds came through the cockpit. It went underneath the other pilot's legs and ended up hitting me in the left foot. I, uh, I pulled, pulled my foot back, uh, realized I'd been shot, informed the rest of the crew, and, uh, and we managed to, to, to get away, thankfully, without sustaining any more casualties um, yeah, on, the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the landing site. Um, yeah, but then uh, as we were flying away, I, I collapsed on the controls, uh, had, to, had to get pulled out of the seat, and, uh, and the, the rest of the crew did an amazing job of getting us back to, uh, back to Bastion safely. That day I got to, yeah, straight into theatre, had the, the, the round uh, removed from my foot and got sent back to the UK, so I was back in Birmingham the following morning where they did further surgery to sort of clean and stitch up the wound. But I've just seen God's hand, you know, amazingly through that, throughout that whole sort of experience. I, I think at the time it could have been so much worse. The, the round could have, could have hit um, uh, the, the other pilot. It could have gone through both of his legs instead of underneath them. It could have hit him in the head, could have hit me in the head. The fact it went through the window and then through two bits of metal before it went into my foot slowed it down enough so that there was no exit wound. Um, and had there been an exit wound, it probably would have removed my foot um, and taken it off. Um, and I was told the next day that had it, had it gone through my foot completely, they would have to have probably amputated mid-calf mid uh, in order to fit the prosthetic um, underneath. Yeah, I'm just so, so thankful that, you know, that it wasn't worse. Um, yeah, none of, you know, uh, no one else that we were picking up got hit. Um, it was just one round to hit the, the aircraft, and it happened to hit me. Um, and in all the, the recovery as well, I think I've had such a, a, a warm support from friends and family um, and people looking out for me. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like I've, you know, the, the recovery was very quick. Um, uh, I was walking the next day. Uh, I was back to work within six weeks. Uh, and I was back in the cockpit and flying again seven weeks later. And, uh, yeah, I, and I just think, I, you know, I'm pretty much back there 100%, not quite back to running. Um, uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll get there eventually. But I'm back to walking, driving, flying. Uh, I can do pretty much everything that I could do before. Uh, and I've just really seen sort of God's support and hand um, on my life, protecting me that day, very much so. Um, it could have been a lot, lot worse. Um, but also since, um, yeah, had, had so many sort of other, other stories of, uh, of God protecting my life. Incredible, isn't it? A serving man in the military, giving thanks to God for the protection that there's been on his life. Do you think he was scared as he slumped over the controls? I wonder what went through his mind. 
He says there are many more incidents that he could tell us about where he's been very aware of God's help and God's protection. As we remember today the events of the 6th of June 1944, and indeed as we commemorate this year the commencement of the First World War, we're very aware that sacrifice is at the heart of remembrance. And you may know that at the heart of the Christian message is the theme of God's unparalleled sacrifice for humanity. During World War I and World War II, sacrifices were made at all sorts of levels. Individuals made sacrifices, families made sacrifices, communities, and of course nationally as well. And as I said, this year marked a hundred years since the outbreak of World War I, in which the total number of military and civilian casualties was over 37 million people. We've already noted, last Friday, 6th of June, 70 years since that event in World War II, more than 156,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of northern France. That day and in the next 24 hours, something between two and a half and 4,000 Allied troops are thought to have died. As many as 9,000 Germans were killed just in that 24-hour period. And as I said, I'm conscious some of you here this morning were caught up in those events. People listening to this online or on CD may well have lived through some of those horrific experiences. And we think today about how the whole country had to make sacrifices for the benefit of a cause so much greater than they themselves could imagine. The defeat of Nazism, the establishment of peace. If you saw some of the... uh, programs this week on the BBC. There was one about letters home and a young man in letters talking about how he just did not feel he could go to war. It was not something he felt was right. And yet it came to a stage where for the greater good, for things beyond his own feelings, he felt he needed to go. And so he went and fought. Today, too, people make sacrifices for causes which benefit other people. They get involved in projects, initiatives, schemes, ministries that they themselves may not particularly enjoy doing, but which they do because they feel compelled for the greater good, for the benefit of a community, for a society, for a country, or even for the world. I came across a fascinating story about Amy Beachy. Amy Beachy lost five sons during World War I. Her sacrifice as a mother was phenomenal. Five sons killed and a sixth son disabled for life. But despite her great pride in her sons, she was herself a reluctant heroine. She received an honour from Queen Mary, to which she responded to the Queen saying, Mom, it was no sacrifice. I did not give them willingly. I did not give them willingly. And that just stuck with me during the week, you know? That idea that we often say people are heroes, heroines. We applaud them for their great sacrifice. And yet here is a mother, maybe telling it the way it is. I didn't give them willingly. As Christians, we believe in a God whose nature is one of sacrifice. A God whose eye is always on the bigger picture. A God who in his son Jesus comes to rescue a wayward and fallen, 
sometimes wicked and evil world from itself and wants to restore it into right relationship with himself. And yet he is a God who undertook the act of sacrifice willingly. Indeed, Jesus on one occasion said, my life isn't taken from me, I lay it down. And indeed, in the passage that Tony read for us a moment ago, from John's Gospel, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. A conscious, deliberate act of self-sacrifice. Jesus has left the church, Christians, with a task. We are called upon to be people who model his ministry, who seek first his kingdom, who are those who go against the enemy, against the foe, seek to defeat the darkness. He called us to be salt and light, to bring flavor and illumination, stopping the rot and shining brightly on a better way to live. It was the English philosopher Edmund Burke who once said, the only thing necessary for triumph, for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. As Christians, we are called to do something. As a church, we're called to be active in our community. We're called to think of others more than ourselves, to look not just after number one, but to be prepared to put the needs, the welfare, the care, the hope of others first we're called upon to model sacrifice. Sacrifice comes in many forms. It doesn't always necessarily lead to death, but it always comes at some cost. We'll watch this. During World War I, nearly 900,000 soldiers and 100,000 civilians lost their lives. That's a staggering and horrific 2.19% of the British population at that time. And many more were wounded, often severely. Here in Ypres, one third of the total military losses occurred. And 90,000 of them have no known graves. And so in 1927, a memorial was opened at the Menin Gate as an expression of gratitude by the Belgian population for the sacrifices that were made for their freedom. On the first night that the memorial was opened, the last post was played as a sign of respect and honour. Since then, something remarkable has happened. Every night at 8pm, a small group of men from the local fire brigade close the road and sound the last post. Remarkably, I haven't missed a night since the 28th of July, 1928. In fact, during the Second World War, when Belgium was occupied, the last post ceremony was conducted instead in Surrey. But, as soon as Polish forces liberated Ypres in the Second World War, the ceremony resumed, even though there was heavy fighting taking place in other parts of the city. For the population of Ypres, it was important to remember the huge price that soldiers paid to bring them freedom. Salient is famous not just for the brutality of the fighting, 
but also for an unassuming Anglican clergyman called Geoffrey Ancatel Studdart Kennedy. You probably know him better as Woodbine Willie. So called for his habit of dishing out Woodbine cigarettes to the wounded and dying on the battlefield, as well as prayer and spiritual guidance. The seventh of nine children and hailing from Leeds, he was a vicar in Worcester when the war broke out. Quickly volunteering, he found himself on the Western Front, and not shying away from danger, he was often operating in no man's land, armed only with his Bible and cigarettes, and he would fearlessly minister to the soldiers. One celebrated story tells of him crawling out to a working party, putting up wire in front of their trench. A nervous soldier challenged him, asking who he was, and he said, The church. When a soldier asked what the church was doing out there, he replied, It's job. In fact, he was awarded the military cross at the Battle of Messonine Ridge for running repeatedly into no man's land to help the wounded. The citation said this, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he showed the greatest courage and disregard for his own safety in attending to the wounded under heavy fire. He searched shell holes for our own and enemy wounded, assisting them to the dressing station, and his cheerfulness and endurance had a splendid effect upon all ranks in the frontline trenches, which he constantly visited. After the war, he became closely involved in the Christian Socialist and the pacifist movements, touring the country giving public lectures. He was in Liverpool on one of his lecture tours in 1929, when he fell ill and died. A crowd of more than 2,000 turned out for his funeral procession, lining from Worcester Cathedral to his old parish church of St Paul. They tossed packets of woodbines onto the passing cortege, a gesture the Reverend Stoddart Kennedy would probably have thoroughly approved of, being a heavy smoker himself. Woodbine Willie was a man who was prepared to put his own life on the line. Motivated by God's love and the message of Jesus, he was prepared to lose his life to bring life to others. Two thousand years ago, Jesus did give up his life for the human race. It was the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible says that no greater love is there than this, that a man gives up his life for his friends. The Bible also gives us a future hope that one day there will be no more war and no more brutality. As we remember those who paid the price 100 years ago during the centenary commemorations, let's also remember this promise from the Bible. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. If we're to follow the example of Jesus, we need to think seriously about what it means to lay down our lives daily for other people. What will that look like in your home? What will that look like in your workplace? In your community? What will it look like for us as a church here? In Risca. There are many ways that the transforming message of the gospel can be shown to this world. So we as a church, as we look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others, others here in Risca, others here in Wales, others in Chad, others in the world, 
We do things. We support the food bank. We support Rhin and Gwaur church planting in North Wales and will be with us next Sunday, so please come and meet them. It's why Grant and Louisa, as you saw earlier, are running thousands of miles to raise money for Guinnibor 2 Hospital in Chad. Sacrifice for something bigger. How much are we prepared to pay as we lay down our lives to serve others? Given an opportunity to put the needs of others first, even people that you don't know and may never even meet, how are you, how am I going to respond? What stops us from stepping out and taking risks or making sacrifices in the name of Jesus for other people? when dad went away because we didn't really um, think about him being in these dangerous situations um, it was quite exciting I think actually to get the blueies and um, the little letters and um, him telling us about the helicopters and all this stuff um, it was only when I became a bit older that I realised that um, people he knew were um, getting killed or um, and that it was quite dangerous there and it could happen to him at some point. As Brandy said, she was in Brawny School and so was Amalia. So um, I was left with Mum and it was a really difficult, um, really difficult just getting on with life without Dad. It tweaked for me that Dad was going somewhere that he could potentially die in when um, I saw on the news um, that people had been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan um, and that really brought it home for me that it wasn't dad that time but it could have been and I didn't know if next time it would be dad. I think on the sort of Five different operational tours I've done. Some of them uh, have been more, um, more dangerous, more kinetic. People have actively been trying to, to kill us, as opposed to perhaps more passive peacekeeping type tours. The, um, I think throughout having joined the military with a strong Christian faith, the reassurance I guess and the, the strength that I've drawn from being able to not only express that faith and pray obviously um, in, it, and develop that relationship with God particularly on my last tour which was, uh, which was amazing just hearing God speaking to me uh, on a regular basis every morning being excited about getting up an hour early to read my Bible and to pray and having the, the time and space to do that um, uh, was amazing and I think, particularly when I was younger and in dangerous, you know, very much in the front line, um, knowing there were people across the UK and actually around the world who were praying specifically as well as generally for me uh, meant that even when the rounds were landing quite close, it was, I had that reassurance that actually um, people were, were remembering me in prayer and that God was looking out for me. So fear has always been something that I've lived with for a long time, possibly because my own father had many dangerous situations in his military career. So it's something that I've been used to, that fear that uh, that wouldn't come back, that fear of somebody coming to the door, that fear of, um, that, that fear of being at the, the end. And so partings are always very difficult. Um, but through it all, God's been very gracious. And 
there has been a process of a loosening, I would say, of those fears as the years have gone by. Um, things that would have made me terrified when I was 20, when I was 40, were far less frightening. And I, a lot of the fears had had eased completely, and I'm, I'm sure that that was to do with seeing God's faithfulness year on year on year and my trust in him growing deeper. I've been reflecting the last few years quite a lot on World War I and, and the devastating impact, I think psychologically, to the nation as well as individually in the lives of families and, and corporately in communities. The reality of what happened in the First World War was very much brought home. And I think the scale of it is what has really struck me in the last few years. Those of us who s have served or are serving in the British Army now make up a tiny fraction of, of the population. Where, um, whereas actually, at the end of the First World War, the British Army was as big as it ever got. It was five million, roughly five million men under arms. And we lost over a million men in casualties. And when you think about our population being only 35, 40 million at the time, half of that being female, half male, and then you look at what your eligible uh, conscription ages were, pretty much everybody was in the military or was directly involved or knew somebody directly involved, and therefore pretty much everybody lost somebody in the First World War. Um, there's an interesting article a few, uh, a couple of years ago about the very few villages throughout, and there's, it's less than 10, villages throughout um, the British Isles where they lost no one in either the First or Second World War. Uh, and, and that really struck me that actually I think we've lost that corporate memory now of how totally devastating the effects of the First World War on our society, on, on actually, uh, on the British Empire. I think it broke us. I think we all draw our security from different, from different areas. And it's very easy to draw all your security from somebody else in a marriage situation or to, dr to, to become independent and draw your security by relying on yourself. As a Christian, it's fantastic to be able to put your security in God, in a God who's good and who has your best interests at heart. And there's a real peace that comes in um, being able to trust him. Remember those who have sacrificed much. But we see the challenge as a church to be a people who also are prepared to sacrifice. Not just in terms that have been discussed this past week, in terms of laying down our lives, but also in giving up much of what we may hold dear so that others can enjoy the freedoms, the liberties, the comforts that many of us take for granted.